So, first of all, I'm excited to share part two of our message on the Great Commission today. But before that, just a big thank you to every individual that was a part of yesterday's uh, clothing drive in partnership with the Lions Charity. I can't tell you, there was not a square inch of floor left. There was just clothing upon clothing upon clothing. And we moved it outside. Maybe in the weeks to come, we can show you some pictures or some videos. Uh, we had planned to move clothes between 10 and 2 o'clock. We, we closed shop by 11 o'clock. And it's gone. And so we achieved the goal. We helped the Lions move all that clothing. And so uh, can we give a hand to all those that helped? There was a lot to, to sort through and to work through, and so we value every bit of participation in the church. And so last week, we started talking about the Great Commission. Hands up, who's heard of it? The Great Commission. Sounds like a movie, the Great Commission. Um, it's in fact the last words given to us by Jesus. We read about it in Matthew 28, and this is what it says. Jesus came near to them uh, and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So he's speaking to his disciples, but it is also inclusive of us. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this is what Jesus tasks us with as a church. This is what we ought to be doing, is making disciples, becoming one, making one, becoming one, making one. So you think, well, Andrew, what is a disciple? We discussed last week, and I'll just share a few things that we said last week to help us. The, the closest English word we find to disciple is the word apprentice or learner. And so the idea of discipleship is that you and I learn from Jesus all that He teaches, and then we apply it in our lives, and we do it and then we teach others how to do that. It sounds simple, but it can be quite confusing. So, so every business exists for a purpose. The business every morning opens doors to achieve one goal. They want to offer a unique service to their clients that will help them. That's the why of the business. A church, the church, has a why. What is our why? The Great Commission. Become disciples that will help make disciples. This equation is not addition. Andrew become one disciple, Andrew make one disciple. No, Andrew become disciple, Andrew make multiple disciples. So instead of addition, we must see discipleship as multiplication, number upon number upon number. Again, in a business, uh, I'm sure you agree, you work for a company probably, you are employed to do something, to be active in, in helping your business achieve their why. And in the church, it's no different. Every believer is commissioned by Jesus to be a part of the Great Commission. Every, look around the room quickly. That's your partners. I won't say partners in crime. We're not into that. These are your partners. We are supposed to be working together to achieve this goal. It's not a work that rests on church staff or church leaders. It is the church's task. So it falls on your lap to help make this possible. And so in keeping in mind that it's the Great Commission, not the great option. The two questions we're going to keep asking ourselves as we do this is, number one, you've got to make this a personal question. How am I doing? Ask yourself, how are you doing with the Great Commission? And secondly, how are we together as Journey Church doing in the Great Commission? And so I'll reiterate what Tamara said, and maybe it's good that we hear this so that it doesn't fall through the cracks. But our church actually has a vision. We've given it words, and this really encapsulates our why. Why do we exist? Journey Church exists to see multitudes of people reach their God-given destiny. We want to see you and me and more others go from where they are to where they should be. God's great plans for them to go on that journey. And so what does that look like? Well, we help people understand salvation. What is it to believe in a God that you can't see? What does it mean to be welcomed into the church and belong somewhere? What is it then to go on that journey of becoming a disciple that will make disciples? And then how do we actually help God build His church? And so that's our vision. And, and please, don't ever see discipleship as a program. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, come, we're going to make you a disciple. Six weeks, two hours, a week, that's all we need, and we're going to make you a disciple. 
Uh, discipleship is, unfortunately, it can be aided by programs, but discipleship is a lifestyle that you and, you and I embrace. We, we daily choose to look to Jesus, to learn from Him, and then actually to do what He does. I think the comfort we find in Matthew 28 is two things. Jesus says all authority. All authority, His authority empowers you and I to do this. So He's not saying, Andrew, do it on your own, in your own strength and understanding. No, I'm going to empower you with my spirit to do it. And he says, I'm going to be with you. That's the comfort we find, that his presence comforts us in the work of ministry. And many of you think, Andrew, I'm not in ministry. Well, you're supposed to be in ministry. All of us are called to ministry. You may not just work for the church full time, but you are involved in ministry. Who yes strive to do their best in school? There was times in my high school career, I, I thought, I just need to scrape through. Like, at, in my day, it was 33%. I'm like, well, 33 and a half is enough. Okay? I wasn't motivated much of high school. But, but you normal people, you would have been motivated to, like, excel, hey? You're like, I want to get distinctions, and you were motivated by reward and recognition. Now, I think we can learn from that. This is not a competition, but are you motivated to be top of the class in the discipleship journey? Or you're just saying, I just want to scrape through. I just want to be average. Or you're saying, no, I'm going to, I want to be the best. We're not in competition, but is that your personal motivation to say, I want to be the best disciple and discipleship or disciple maker that I can be? Learning from Jesus and doing what He does. Moving on to some new things for this week. In Christianity, some things are free, some things are not. In our faith, some things are free, some things are not. And so today we're going to look at the cost of discipleship and what Jesus said about it, because it's going to cost us. Listen to what he said. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, now, when Jesus speaks, you and I go, because it matters what he says. And he, and he said to them, if you want to. So if means it's optional. You don't have to. You're invited, but it's not a, you're not forced to. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Who would have stood up and walked away? This guy's crazy. Now, like, if you were sitting there, wow, that's a strong call. That's a big cost. Jesus said, otherwise you cannot. You can try, but you cannot be my disciple if you don't do that. And if you do not carry your cross, not his cross, your cross, and follow me, Jesus again says, you cannot be my disciple. And then he says, but don't begin. He says, but don't begin until you count the cost. He was being very cautious, saying, I know you want to, but you, you, you need to consider the cost. So, because he knows that in, in our faith, some things are free, some things are not. So I think we'll pause and just like there's a disclaimer here, so we don't get confused. When Jesus says that you've got to hate everyone, including yourself, you think, is Jesus, does he have dementia? Is he contradicting himself? Because didn't he give us the, the great command to love God and to love people? And I say, I must now hate them. A rock in a hard place. Which one, Jesus? Must I hate them? Must I? love them. And so it's just the word play that makes it difficult for us. But the word hate yeah just means to love less. <sighs> okay. That's all Jesus is saying. He's saying, you can't love anyone or anything more than me. It's Jesus saying, I have to have first place or no place. He, he can't fit in second, third, fourth down the line in our lives. Jesus says, if we're going to be disciples, he has to have first place. We know that the call to discipleship is not a lonely journey. We think, oh, I'm going to have to abandon everything and just live this lonely life, just being as surrendered to Jesus as possible. No. We, we see by the simple healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus goes with Peter to his, not his mother's house, his mother-in-law's house. So he had a wife, and they obviously had good relationship that Jesus would go with Peter to his mother-in-law's house and healed her. There, so that you can still hold a family, you can still live a normal life and still be a disciple. Isn't that good to know? Because I think our perception of discipleship is complete abandonment and live a complete new life that's foreign. No, you can still live in Frenichen, hold your job, 
continue your journey, church, stay married, enjoy kids and life, okay? But Jesus has to have first place. He carries on and says this, Luke 14. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Again, he says, third time, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. I'm often, I'm still waiting for an answer. Maybe you can help me with the answer. Um, I wonder if there is a difference between just an average believer and a disciple. You can give me the answer one day if, if you have the answer to that question. But, but Jesus says three times, you cannot be my disciple if you don't give up everything you own. So again, this is not a call to sell your house, bring all the money to the church, rock up with a bag at the door and go, here I am. It doesn't mean that. It's, it's in our hearts. We, we give up those things and we... Jesus, you're in first place. So Jesus uses two metaphors to highlight one single reality of discipleship. It will cost you. Some things in our faith are free. Some things are not. So I'll put it in these words to help you. Your salvation costs Jesus his life. Your discipleship will cost you your life. You can't pay for your sins. Jesus paid for them. But Jesus cannot pay for your discipleship. Your discipleship is your cost to pay. No one's going to do it for you. No one's going to go the extra mile. No one's going to arrive. No one's going to sacrifice. No one's going to invest for you. It's what you have to do yourself. And so the question, what is it going to cost me? Well, it's going to cost you, you. <laughs> Lord, here's my life. As you gave your life, Lord, now I give my life in return. That's the cost of discipleship. Jesus calls us to complete abandonment. All my hopes, all my desires, all my dreams, Lord, I lay it at your feet. Do with me as you please. You've probably heard some of these words before. So thinking about this, there's a cost Jesus pays, there's a cost that we pay. Who if I said to you, I'm going to pay for you to go on a cross-country trip of Italy to eat all the best food, the bread, the pastas, the enjoy the red wine, see the countryscape, the sea, the hills. Who's up for it? I'll even give you, I'll throw in a Vespa that you can go around the country with. Hey? And if you want, there's Ferrari trips as well. Who's going? All expenses paid. I'm going to send you there. 200,000 plus minimum. Whatever it is, blank check, I'll, I'll send you. Who's going? I will pay... But do you know that you still have to wake up on the morning of your flight? You have to drive yourself to the airport, board the airplane, fly many hours, it's tiring, get off, go to the hotel, get in a car, go to the restaurant, go cross country, walk, do everything so that you can maximize the journey afforded to you. It's, it's paid, but you have to pay a different cost. I will pay the greater cost, but if you actually want to enjoy it, and this is exactly what we learned, Jesus has paid for our salvation. We must pay the cost for discipleship if we want to get the most out of life with Jesus. He can't pay it for us. We have to pay the cost. Does it make sense? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's a German theologian. He said this, and we mentioned it in a probably an evening service a few weeks ago, if I can recall. But he says this, it's not the, the normal call to Christianity that some of us hear, but he says, when a Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It's a stark contrast because we know that don't we find eternal life in God? And doesn't John 10.10 10 say that I have abundant life if I follow Jesus? But Christianity, the, the call is come and die. It's, it's the whole upside down kingdom of God. Where if we do surrender ourselves, that's only when life actually begins. So we surrender, we die to self, passions, everything. We say, Lord, not my way, but your way. Then we experience true and eternal life. And if you think if Jesus calls us to hate or love less anyone, including ourselves, then surely it includes everything. 
There's many things in our life that com will compete for first place. Work and this thing and hobbies, whatever it is. And Jesus says, you've got to live just in that balance of, of never letting me slip into second, third, fourth. Because it won't go well for you. God says, no, you, I have to be in first place all the time. He's not happy with second, third, or, or down the line. And so I want to ask a question. I don't think you can answer it right now, maybe. But what is it costing you to follow Jesus? Because it has to cost you something. You can't truly follow Jesus and it be free. Because he said, you, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to consider the cost. He even says, don't get involved until you've considered the cost. What is it costing you to follow Jesus? Who or what have you turned from? And remember, turning to always means turning from. So the call of the first disciples, they were fishing. They were employed in business. And Jesus says, hey, come follow me. And what do they do there? They drop nets. They drop their occupation. That was their call. And they, they turned from and they turned to. We always will have to turn from things, from people, in order to fully embrace discipleship. There's no running, hiding from that reality. I spoke to a gentleman um, that I see every now and then. Um, from how I understand the situation, he is a believer, his wife is not. They obviously still live together. That creates a lot of tension. It's just two different value systems. And I'm not sure if she was a believer and, and kind of just gave up on God and church or if they came into the marriage as unbelievers and he came to believe in Jesus. But anyway, they're still together. And he tells me that it's a l very difficult for him um, because he has it in his heart to do what's right and to follow God. But he says, you know, many times he, he can come home from church and it just gets thrown back in his face and he gets called hypocrite and it just creates so much friction. And so I want to ask you, what do you think he should do? <laughs> what do you do in the moment? And he says, you know what I've done, Andrew, is that I've decided to, to come to church less just to keep the peace. So I'm not going to give the answer, but I want you to maybe give me the answer. What do you think that gentleman should do in that predicament, that difficult and a hard place? See, discipleship is confrontational, it is challenging, but we cannot ignore it if it's the last words Jesus gave us, and he said, go. It's not the great option, it's the great commission. And he says, if you're going to get involved, it's going to cost you something. So we can't be fooled into thinking, I'm going to have all these benefits and pay no price. Some things in our faith are free, some things are not. Dallas Willard says, when speaking about the cost of discipleship, he said the cost is high and it's so great, but he says the cost of non-discipleship is far greater. It's like we can't run the risk to not be discipled. It will cost us more in the long run. Rather just pay the cost that's necessary to become disciples that help make disciples. I hope this is challenging you. We shouldn't be a comfortable church. Jesus didn't say go to church, although we should go and come. He said go and make disciples. And who knows that it cannot happen in one hour on a Sunday. It's not a program. It's a lifestyle that we embrace. And, and here's the truth. All of us are motivated differently, either positively or negatively with the Great Commission. And having the right motivation will change everything. I want you to think about two employees that work for the same company doing the same job. Let's make it a baker. They have the same job. They arrive at the same time. They got to do the same thing. They got to bake chocolate croissants for Andrew. That's the problem that I have that they need to solve. That's their why. Okay, they got to work to do that. Now, now the one baker goes to work because he knows he has to pay the salary. I mean, the, the bills at home. So all he needs is a, a salary. That's why he goes to work. Many of us go to work for that. We just got to pay the bills. But then, what about the other baker? Same job, same time, same everything. He goes, but he has a passion for food. And he loves to bake chocolate croissants for Andrew. And he says, oh, even if I have to come in a little bit earlier or leave a bit later, I would love to do that. And the business says, you know, it's been tough. We're going to have to drop your salary. He said, it's fine because I love food. I'm passionate about it. How is it that two people can be called to the same thing and just by motivation have two different experiences? It's no different in our discipleship journey, in our understanding of it and our involvement in it. 
You can either do it because it, you see it as a duty, or you can do it because you see it as your delight. Same thing, different experiences. I want to help us uh, get the right motivation by, by looking at two parables that mean the same thing. Matthew 13. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and I want you to mark the, the colors of the words because they link together and it's two parables meaning the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. What Jesus is illustrating here is this is what happens when our hearts are awakened by grace. We go, is this what life is supposed to be? Is this the kingdom of God and all that it represents and God's love and His grace? And you go, well, I will do anything to have that. That's what Jesus is illustrating. And we never forget that God's love is a transforming love. You encounter God and you are changed. You, you can't encounter God and stay the same. And so if we look at those words, treasures and pearls, it, it means something of great value. Here speaking about the kingdom of God. Sold everything and all. We heard about this in the discipleship. The cost. What will it cost you? This is the renouncing of lesser things, the things of this world. I see something greater, so I let go of that which is lesser. And it says that he bought. What is it? That he paid the price for greater things. And I love this word. We'll mark it here. Joy. That should be our heart in the discipleship journey. We go, wow. Because my heart has been awakened to grace, it will be my delight. It will be my joy to continue becoming a disciple myself and then helping others on that same journey. And so it's God's grace that motivates us in the Great Commission. See, if we look at duty and delight, if, if, if I don't know God's grace, it will only be religious duty. I'll do it because Jesus says I have to. Boring. I could find 10,000 10, other things to rather do. See, but with God's grace, it becomes self-fulfilling. It is rewarding for you to become a disciple, and it is so satisfying to watch others grow. You'll be, you'll be happy to pay the cost. It's been my, my privilege to, over the years, watch people go from zero to hero, sometimes in a few months, sometimes over a period of years and years and years, to go, wow, I remember where you were. Look at you now. And to know that I, I played a small role in, in helping you in your journey, wow, it is a delight to be a part of that journey. But it is also our duty, and we won't make light of that. And so... I think here's a truth that we often forget. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, the context is actually sexual immorality, but there's something hidden there that we can learn from that's a, a principle and a truth for our faith. So, so Paul writes to the church where there are some issues, and he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Like God, by His Spirit, dwells in you. That, like, that makes you different. Who is in you, whom you have received from God. And he says this, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Tell the person next to you, you don't belong to you. Tell the other person, you are not your own. Therefore, it says, honor God with your body. See, this truth is fundamental to understanding discipleship. That um, we don't belong to ourselves. So I understand if I don't belong to me, if I feel I belong to myself, then it is an option if I want to get involved in the commission. But knowing that I've been bought at a heavy price, the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, then I am employed in His service, that this must become my task. I have to be employed in the great commission, daily resisting the urge to take back my life. Jesus, thank you for helping me when I was in, in the valley, but I'm going to take my life back now. I'm going to enjoy some of the rewards you will give me, but I'm also going to just create many of my own without you. Life on my terms or life on God's terms? It's like, no. I've relinquished everything. It's not my life. And so, Lord, I'll, I'll gladly be employed in becoming a disciple that will help 
make disciples. So yes, it is a delight, but it is also our duty. The truth is, if it is the Great Commission for all the church, if you and I are not actively involved in making disciples, then you and I are slowing down the boat. We may be in the boat enjoying the ride, but we're not helping row. And Jesus says, no, no, no. We're all in the boat. We're all in this together. Who wants to sing it? But we all have to be rowing. We don't want to be freeloaders. We don't want to just benefit from everyone else's sacrifices and involvement and their gifts. Jesus says, no, we all help with this. And so this morning, I would say, I don't want to ask you, will you pay the cost? I want to encourage you to pay the cost. Just do it. It's not foreign. This is what God expects from each one of us. And here's the thing. Right now, it will look different for each one of us. I don't know what it would look like for you to pay the cost. In my 19 years of following Jesus, it's, it's cost me certain things. And I can list them for you one day. But it was unique to my journey. And Jesus came at different points and said, Andrew, let go. Come. Step up. Give less. Give more. And so you've got to intimately follow Jesus and say, Lord, what do you want from me? Who and what must I give up now so that I can move forward in my discipleship journey? Again, the benefits is personally, it's self-fulfilling and so satisfying to help watch others in their journey. The corporate benefit for us is that the church gets healthier. Anyone want to be a part of an unhealthy dying church? So let's keep it healthy. How do we keep it healthy? We, we continue with this. Become disciples that make disciples. It's like it's never ending. It's been going on from the early days of the church. It's just generation after generation after generation. We all help make disciples. But the truth is we can't enjoy the benefits if we aren't willing to pay the cost. Again, I'll close in this. If we think about Jesus, it's your salvation cost him his life, but your discipleship will cost you your life. Salvation is God's love to you. Discipleship is your love to Him. He can't pay that for you. It's something you bring. It's your life that you offer up to Him. It's all yours, God. It's all yours. I want you to take a moment and reflect on what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you or maybe what the Word of God challenged you with. I know, it's challenging. It is confrontational. But we can't settle for a version of Christianity that is comfortable. Jesus, the Son of God, said, count the cost. I wish it were comfortable. I wish it were easy. But it's not. But you know, things of great value on earth are always worth paying high prices for. And I've seen it. Oh, it's cost me this and it's cost me that. But in the end, I saw the reward and I went, wow. The investment was incredibly worth it. The change that it brought about, maybe in my life or in the lives of others, was so worth it. Church, we must never forget that it's impossible to give to God and come back empty-handed. It's, it's just not who He is. It's not His Father's heart. It's not how the kingdom works. As we offer ourselves... There's a harvest of 30, 60, 100 fold coming back. I give my little. God does much with it. Let me close in this prayer for us. Lord, by your amazing grace, revive our hearts and minds to the power of the gospel. For which Paul said, I'm unashamed of it. May we value the price paid for our salvation, the blood of your one and only Son. In light of this, give us a strong conviction and the desire to fulfill the Great Commission. Holy Spirit, show each one of us what our next step must be. Lord God, you are worthy to be praised, to be followed, and to be served. And today I know that Perhaps there's someone, a few people. The point of or the journey of discipleship starts first with Jesus. Before we do anything, we become. 
We come into right standing with God through His Son. Without Christ, we stand as the enemies of God because of sin in our life. But because of His great love, He sent His Son so that when we believe in Him and God looks at us, He doesn't see our sin and unrighteousness. He sees, his, he sees us through His Son. And He sees us as pure and innocent. That's where discipleship starts. Following that, you begin to seek Him and serve Him in different ways. But the journey starts with choosing Christ. And it helps us to draw a line in the sand to say, today, now, so that you will always remember that that's when I made the decision. Because when you and I are confronted with the love of God, we must be transformed. Jesus paid the price for our salvation. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But we must choose it. It's a choice. God will not force it upon us. Maybe you know in your heart of hearts that that's me today. The future may not make sense. My decision may not make sense, but I know it's the right decision to make. To respond to Christ and say, yes, Lord, I realize my need for you. Lord, come into my life. Help me to follow you. I would love to acknowledge you and pray for you this morning. It's the first step of a lifelong journey, an eternal journey, to choose Jesus. No one's watching. If you won't mind just raising your hand, I'm going to acknowledge you. God bless 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 you. So many hands. So many hands. I don't know what that hand means or represents, but God does. God sees your heart. And Lord, we pray for every person responding to you in this moment. Thank you, God, that you see them, you know them, and that you promise to love and help them, God. Bless them, we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. And we said, Amen. Amen. Can we give them a big hand?